2402 lecture respiratory system screencast five so remember when i told you that we would go down through those four things and i talked in the previous screencast about uh pulmonary ventilation Let's see if i can show you that prove to you that i did it so pulmonary ventilation this was the previous uh, screencast so now we're moving on to step two which is external respiration this is going to be gas exchange in the lungs with the blood and there are three main factors that will uh, control this this is pp this is partial pressure gradients and then gas solubility so really steep gradients so if i've got a lot of oxygen on one side of the membrane and not a lot of oxygen on the other side of the membrane a lot of oxygen is going to go across right so it's like kind of like proportional to how great the differences are if there's equal amounts on either side you're not going to get a net movement of oxygen in one direction or the other so in your lungs o2 and co2 both diffuse down their gradients that is when I take a breath, my lungs fill with oxygen and oxygen goes down its gradient into the blood. At the same time, CO2, which is dissolved in the blood, goes down its gradient back into the lungs. So I'm, I'm with every breath, I'm doing a little diffusion exercise. Uh, the thickness and surface area of the respiratory membrane, I already told you this is really thin, right? It's a really thin membrane. And I uh, didn't mention how big it is, but the inside of your lungs, if you unfold it at all, would take up about 90 square meters. And that's a little bit less than half a tennis court. You might say, well, how can it fit half a tennis court inside of my inside of my chest? Well, it's a real thin tennis court and there's a lot of folds in it. And all of those folds are all of those alveoli, right? And alveolar sacs. So when I crinkle up that piece of paper into it, I can crinkle it up into a pretty small ball. It's still got the same surface area, but it uh, takes up a lot less space. And that's how your lungs work. Uh, this can be affected by uh, some disorders. Emphysema really drops your uh, surface area because it blows out those alveoli. Silicosis is like a, uh, and, and black lung diseases are, are particulate matter getting messed up in there and they'll really hammer your surface area too. Lastly is what's called ventilation perfusion coupling. It sounds confusing, but it is really simple. So ventilation, how much air is getting there. Perfusion, how much blood is going to go there. So you want to couple your alveoli so that the ones that get the most ventilation get the most perfusion. So high O2 and low CO2 get the most blood flow, blood flow being perfusion. And the next slide will illustrate that. So here is a kind of a smaller alveolus. Let's see this little yellow blob here. That's kind of a deflated bag, whereas this guy's all full, right? So this one has lots of ventilation, and as a result, what you do is you increase blood flow to that area. See up here, this is kind of your standard, your baseline. Well, this, this guy's got a lot of oxygen, which means I want that, so I'm going to increase blood flow to the capillaries that supply that alveolus. Contrary, over here, if this guy's got a mucus plug stuck in there so that there's not much oxygen getting to this alveolus, you're going to cut off blood flow. You're not going to send miners into a... Uh, a gold mine that doesn't produce any gold, right? Uh, you're, you're gonna, if you own a mining company or something, you're going to send all of your miners into the gold mine that produces the most gold, kind of like over here, right? That's basically internal respiration. Now let's go to, I'm sorry, external respiration. Internal respiration is only this little blue blurb right here, right? Uh, where are we? Uh, hold on, wait getting lost it's this program doesn't respond very fast so external respiration <sighs> gas goes across the lung membrane gas transport I'm putting afterwards but suffice to say when you get down to the tissues uh, O2 and CO2 are going to diffuse down their gradients just like they did in the lungs only in this case kind of the opposite direction O2 is going to go into the cells and from the blood and CO2 is going to go out of the cells into the blood Gas transport. Uh, the book puts it here, and I put it here. I guess in real perfect world, it should have been before internal respiration, but whatever. Uh, let's talk about oxygen transport first. That's the one you think of uh, first and foremost when you think of gases being transported. 
98.5% uh, of this is carried by a molecule in your red blood cells called hemoglobin, with the other 1.5 being dis just dissolved in the plasma. So the vast majority of it is carried by hemoglobin. When hemoglobin has oxygen, it's called oxyhemoglobin. That makes sense. When it doesn't, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. Simple. Each hemoglobin carry four oxygen. And now, interestingly, uh, as those... Uh, I'm going to try and draw here. I wasn't planning on it, but we're going to try. So as those, uh, here, I'm going to draw a hemoglobin molecule. So I'm going to draw it like a four-leaf clover because it can carry four oxygen. Let's just say a hemoglobin molecule meets up with Mr. Oxygen here and picks him up. Okay. I'm just going to draw O. It's really O2. That increases that hemoglobin's affinity, which is desire for or attraction to the next oxygen. So as soon as you pick up one, you get kind of a taste for it. And then you pick up another. And if there's oxygen nearby, you're going to pick them up. So you're going to really start gobbling up those oxygen. As you pick each one up, you want the hemoglobin wants more until it gets to four. At the tissues, when you're going to drop those off, as you drop them off, your desire for them goes down. So as you start dropping them off, it gets easier to drop them off. And as you pick them up, it gets easier to pick them up. I think I explained that okay. All right. Uh, drawing time is over. Uh, here I say even deoxygenated blood has some oxyhemoglobin. So you're, even after that blood goes through your leg muscles, let's just say you're doing some squats, so you're really high oxygen demand, and the blood goes down through your muscles, drops off a bunch of oxygen, and then starts returning back to your heart. That returning blood still has oxygen. The values, I'm not going to have you know the numbers and percentages and all that. The book goes into it. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Um, but it does give you an oxygen reserve, right? You don't want to only have one breath of oxygen left in you because if there's a break in that chain, you're going to suffocate immediately. So you do keep oxygen and you pretty much fully oxygenate it in your lungs. But then when it goes down into the muscles, it'll, you'll draw some of that oxygen off, but not all of it. One last thing for this particular video, and that is another, uh, person's name and a phenomenon associated with it. I believe we had what Boyle's law, uh, Dalton's law, Henry's law. And now we've got the Bohr effect. You may already be experiencing the Bohr effect. <laughs> oh, hmm. Okay. What this Bohr effect states is that if you, I'm just going to use my, I, use, I always use my leg muscles for this, but you can use your, your abdomen or whatever. Deep in your body, at those tissues, not your lungs, but other tissues, there are certain conditions present which encourage hemoglobin to unload oxygen. Those conditions are relatively high temperature, a high pre uh, partial pressure of CO2, and low pH, or acidic conditions. So under these conditions, Hemoglobin is kind of like, meh, what am I doing with this oxygen? I think I'll let go of it. So he's kind of, hemoglobin's kind of like got two different moods, right? In your lungs, where the conditions are not as hot, not as much CO2, and not acidic, hemoglobin really wants the oxygen. At your body tissues, where these conditions are present, Hemoglobin changes its mind and goes, you know, why did I pick up these four oxygens here? I'll drop one or two of them off. Then that hemoglobin in the blood cells goes back to the lungs and it's like, what was I thinking? Look at all these oxygens. Grabs them. Goes back to the tissues. Eh, here you go, right? So the Bohr effect kind of works in both directions. Uh, it concerns oxygen. We'll see another one later that concerns CO2. And these are the conditions. So keep, if you can remember these conditions, high temperature, high CO2, low pH, or acidic conditions. These conditions cause hemoglobin to drop off the oxygen. The opposite of those conditions encourages them, hemoglobin to pick it up. 